Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Need Tech webinar series. Today's webinar is that famous CDC mantra we've all heard before, identify, isolate, and inform. The eyes have it. So I, on behalf of Need Tech, would like to welcome you today. I'm Shelly Sweethelm, and I am a nurse leader, uh, one of the program directors for uh, Need Tech, as well as a subject matter expert. And I'm a nurse uh, at Nebraska Medicine and serve as one of the leaders of our Global Center for Health Security. I'm really excited to tell you about our speakers today. So one speaker we have is Kate Bolter, and she's the nurse manager at the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. And she also is one of our leaders for education and technical assistance for NETEC. So Kate has uh, supervised all of the operations, uh, policy development, helps with lots of our different biopreparedness grants. She's on our NETEC leadership team. And then, as I mentioned, she's also very actively involved in NETEC, particularly in the long-term care area. And then I'd also like to also uh, make sure that we introduce Dr. James Lawler. Dr. Lawler is co-director of the Global Center for Health Security at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. He's also an associate professor in infectious disease, and he's one of our deputy medical directors for the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. Dr. Lawler has a long career as an, uh, an infectious disease physician. He served in lots of different medical and public health uh, preparedness work, including outbreak response and serving to uh, support many different missions. He advises a lot on local, state, and national leadership, particularly around COVID and other infectious diseases. And he's retired from the U.S. Navy Medical Corps after 21 years of active service. So today you can tell our agenda there uh, laid out before you. We're going to discuss, identify, isolate, and inform. We're going to particularly talk about the current landscape of loss of fever. <clears throat> As we know, uh, with international travel, uh, we've heard a lot in the, the news about um, several cases uh, in Nigeria and elsewhere. And so, as we know, uh, most infectious diseases are only a plane ride away. And then Kate will go into a little bit more detail about what to do in each step of the process. And we'll finally uh, just kind of finish it up with some additional information on identify, isolate, and inform in uh, the current pandemic. And then we'll get to your questions, of course. Now I want to spend just a couple of minutes going into a little detail about who is NETEC and what do we do. So NETEC's mission statement is to set in advance the gold standard for special pathogen preparedness and response across healthcare delivery systems. With the goals of really driving best practices, closing those knowledge gaps that exist, and developing innovative resources to really help people uh, further their knowledge and understanding of special pathogens. These are our areas of focus, and we've actually added a fourth one recently, uh, which is international. Uh, we're really trying to start to work um, across and out with international experts who also have uh, containment areas and work with them on international strategies, uh, best practices, et cetera. But other areas that are core to NETEC include consultation. So we have some self-assessment tools that are on our website. We work hard to uh, provide any uh, technical support for uh, information sharing that we can do. If you have a particular question, just go to the website and click, uh, you know, in and just let us know what your question is and a subject matter expert will get back to you. Uh, today, obviously, is one example of our education and training. We also have podcasts. Uh, lots of different opportunities, uh, resources in our repository. Uh, don't start if you uh, have something that you need to develop from a policy perspective. Go in there, see what you can find, customize it, call it your own. Uh, really, everything we have is, is outward facing and available. And then we have some great exercise templates as well for an airborne pathogen, viral hemorrhagic fever pathogen. And then we've got a great mystery patient drill for entry areas. So as you think about today and the presentation, uh, you'll see clearly how important maybe doing one of those mystery patient drills might be in your ER or maybe even a clinic setting. So I want to turn it over now to Kate Bolter on background on Identify, Isolate, and Form. Kate, over to you. Thank you, Shelley. <clears throat> so um, thank you, everybody, for being on this webinar today. And it is a real pleasure to be here to be able to talk to you. So most of you will 
remember that this infographic that the CDC developed back in 2014, 2015, when we were dealing with the Ebola virus outbreak. And this was really created to help um, hospitals identify, isolate, and inform for Ebola virus. And you can see here, you know, like number two, it gives you the signs and symptoms of Ebola virus and um, tells you how to move through that process. Back then, because it was focused on Ebola, um, and, and we didn't have very much in the country, we were really like, wanting to know if people had to come from outside of the country. So we were asking um, exposure history first. Nowadays, we would recommend that you ask things like signs and symptoms first. That would then allow you to identify that there might be a risk for infection, put some precautions in place, and then you can further investigate to see if you know they've, they've been to a country that, that you've got some worries about. The other thing about this is that it's been able to evolve and we've been able to evolve it over the last couple of years to also include um, things like COVID. And uh, it's been a really great tool um, in helping us get through that. But one of the things that you really um, need to know is you need to know what the current risks are. You need to be aware of what it is that's out there that could be coming to your door and it could come at any time. And as um, Dr. Lawler is gonna to explain to you, um, uh, the UK has, you know, recently experienced that. And so you, once you know what the risks are, you can adapt this to, to meet your needs. And um, always remember, you know, that, that early identification, that, that is like the really important thing that you need to do. So I'm going to pass the mic to James and, um, and I'll be back after he's you know, talked a little bit to you and we'll go through the process of identify, isolate and inform. So it's all yours now, James. All right, thank you, Kate. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be able to uh, talk to you all here today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about loss of fever and how it's a great example of the importance of uh, identify, isolate and inform. And, and obviously the first step in that is always uh, identify. So next slide, please. And we're going to talk uh, specifically about a, a very recent case that occurred in the UK uh, that resulted in three infections uh, being managed in, in the hospital. Unfortunately, one of them died. So uh, this index patient uh, came to uh, a hospital in the UK uh, in early January and presented with a syndrome of uh, fever, fatigue, malaise, and GI symptoms. And had recently returned from a trip to Mali uh, just a week before, <clears throat> um, but at the time was not identified as a potential uh, viral hemorrhagic fever, uh, was uh, identified as a potential risk for malaria. Um, and so the patient was treated in the hospital with antibiotics, the malaria tests were negative, uh, and was discharged from the hospital after just a few days uh, and went home. Now at home, uh, this uh, patient had contact with a, a household member who was uh, in late-term pregnancy. And uh, about uh, a week, 10 days later, that contact started to develop uh, a febrile illness. And that contact did not have any travel history uh, outside of the UK. Uh, and so that, uh, that contact was uh, admitted to the hospital a few days after that in labor. So we're now about three weeks out uh, from when this uh, index case had presented. Uh, and so uh, both the mother and the, the newborn who was born uh, became ill. And uh, unfortunately, the loss of diagnostic tests took a while to come back. And it wasn't until the 8th of February that these diagnostic tests returned positive. Unfortunately, the, the newborn continued to suffer increasing illness and, and uh, the death of the newborn was uh, announced on February 11th. Uh, fortunately, the mother recovered, <clears throat> and so two out of the three cases uh, survived. Uh, one had relatively mild illness, and uh, one, unfortunately, newborn child uh, succumbed. But as a result of this, because these patients had been treated in the hospital for an extended period of time before uh, loss of fever diagnosis was made uh, via laboratory testing, uh, required a large number of healthcare workers to, to undergo uh, quarantine uh, and uh, and testing. Fortunately, 
Uh, there have not been recorded uh, cases among the hospital workers, but but obviously this was a household contact uh, of a case who was not severely ill, ill enough to be admitted to the hospital for a few days, but again, not critically ill uh, and, and not manifesting a bleeding uh, uh, symptoms or signs. Uh, and so illustrates the fact that that household contacts and that type of close contact are a, a significant risk for uh, transmission of, of Lhasa. So uh, Lhasa fever is a viral hemorrhagic fever that's caused by Lhasa virus. This is a member of the Arena virus uh, family. And if you um, are big into your viral hemorrhagic fever trivia, you recognize that arena viruses are one of the families of viruses that are associated with VHF. And uh, there's a large number of viruses in uh, South America that are associated with hemorrhagic fever. <clears throat> uh, just about every country in South America has a hemorrhagic fever named after it, Argentine hemorrhagic fever, Bolivian, Brazilian, Venezuelan, etc. Uh, but Lhasa fever is the most important of the arena viruses because it is so prevalent uh, in West Africa, as we'll see. Arena viruses get their name from the sandy little granules that appear in electron microscopy. So uh, arena in Latin means uh, sandy. Now, the, the vector and, and reservoir for Lhasa fever is this cute little guy, the multi-mammate rat or mastemus. Uh, it is a common uh, rodent that is uh, lives in, in fields and forests uh, in uh, West Africa. But during the dry season, uh, will come into homes when food sources get scarce uh, late in the dry season. And that correlates with this seasonal variation that we see in Lhasa every year in West Africa. You can see early in the year are the highest rates of Lhasa fever generally, uh, and there are yearly epidemics that occur uh, in Nigeria and in that area around Sierra Leone. Uh, and that's the late dry season. Dry season in West Africa generally goes from around November to March. But by January, uh, food sources are uh, somewhat scarce for these little guys, and they uh, tend to come in closer to houses and, and uh, urban environments to try and get food. And that's where people are generally exposed. So the, the peak season for Lhasa is really kind of January through March, and we're just exiting that peak season now. And as I mentioned, Lhasa is an incredibly common disease in, in West Africa, much more common, I think, than most people realize. There's an estimated 100 to 500,000 cases that occur every year in West Africa. And there are certainly good years and bad years in West Africa. And so in, in very bad years, uh, those case counts may go even higher than that. Uh, the last uh, significantly bad uh, year for Lhasa in Nigeria was in 2018, where they had a very large uh, outbreak that occurred. Um, the majority of these cases are actually mildly symptomatic, and some are even asymptomatic. And so uh, the number of cases that get recognized as Lhasa and are admitted to the hospital tend to be the ones that are sicker. Uh, but overall, the, the, the cases are in general um, much uh, less uh, pronounced and, and look just like flu-like illness. And so the overall infection fatality rate is probably only around 1%, maybe a little higher. And it's estimated there's around 5,000 deaths annually in West Africa. But for cases that are sick enough to make it into the hospital, uh, those are generally ones that have significant organ system uh, dysfunction and uh, potentially bleeding manifestations the case fatality uh, ratio for those cases is often quoted as around uh, 20 to 30%. Um, but again, the, the, the fact it's so common in areas of Sierra Leone and Liberia where uh, there's these large outbreaks every dry season, in, in the peak season, uh, it's estimated that 10 to 15% of, of febrile cases presenting to the hospital are actually Lhasa uh, in some of these regions. So the way you uh, acquire Lhasa is highlighted in this uh, very uh, helpful CDC graphic here. <clears throat> Again, it is transmitted by these mastemus rats, uh, and these rats come in contact uh, with people uh, in <clears throat> generally in uh, peri-domestic uh, environments or in houses themselves, uh, and people either come in contact with their droppings or urine, uh, cleaning, sweeping, uh, or sometimes when the rats get into food sources, Sometimes these rats are actually prepared as food. Uh, they are uh, a common protein source in many areas of West Africa. And so uh, preparing uh, 
the rats and coming into contact with feces or urine or potentially the other blood and body fluids can result uh, in infection. And then again, rarely there is transmission from person to person. This is often the case when it is a close household contact, as we saw in the case in Southeast England. Uh, and there is certainly a high risk for healthcare workers uh, who are taking care of these patients. Nosocomial transmission of loss of fever is well documented in many, many cases. In general, this transmission occurs in hospitals that have uh, limited resources uh, and may not be able to adhere to or do not adhere to good infection prevention and control practices. Uh, and, and so uh, hospitals in uh, West Africa where a disease endemic are uh, noted for having uh, nosocomial outbreaks, um, the, the transmission rates in, uh, in hospitals in Europe and the US are much, much lower. Uh, because um, adherence to basic infection prevention and control practices can significantly limit transmission and hopefully recognition of the, the infection and, and appropriate isolation obviously uh, will prevent further transmission in the hospital as well. So the clinical presentation and, and recognizing LASA is obviously uh, going to be the, the, the way that we initially identify uh, these patients and can isolate. So in addition to geographic risk factors, so patients coming from uh, that area of West Africa where Lhasa is endemic, uh, clinical presentation can be a helpful clue. Although like many viral hemorrhagic fevers early on in the course of illness, uh, it's uh, a bit general and, and not necessarily specific. Uh, most cases of LASA prevent, present like a, uh, a flu-like illness. Many, again, are relatively mild, uh, but some can be more severe. And so you have patients presenting as this patient did in the UK with fever, malaise, body aches. Headache is often common. Gastrointestinal symptoms are frequently reported. And some of the clues uh, that this is a, a VHF or LASA may be sore throat and significant conjunctivitis, as you can see in this patient here, although those actually occur in a minority of, uh, of patients. Um, and then as the disease progresses, you can get to more significant organ system dysfunction. You often get uh, tissue swelling, facial edema, which can be a, a common uh, sign in more severe disease, as you can see in the picture here. Uh, and then in very severe disease, uh, patients can manifest uh, uh, bleeding disorder, uh, and that can sometimes present as abnormal bru bruising, uh, petechial lesions, bleeding or oozing from IV sites or from uh, the, the gums. Uh, and patients can also present with uh, severe neurological uh, dysfunction as well when they're more severely ill. Common laboratory features to look out for are thrombocytopenia or low platelets, uh, a significant elevation of protein in the urine, and elevated liver enzymes can be good clues. Again, the case fatality uh, ratio uh, for hospitalized patients is uh, around 30%, uh, but it does appear to be much higher for pregnant women. <clears throat> um, in uh, interestingly and importantly, a large proportion of survivors uh, of loss of fever, uh, those sick enough to wind up in the hospital, have uh, residual sensorineural hearing loss, which is a very common uh, side effect that can be uh, lifelong. Diagnosis of loss, again, recognition of the clinical syndrome and the risk factors is the most important uh, piece to identifying potential um, uh, patients under investigation or, or suspect cases, because diagnosis really needs to be done in specialized laboratories. In the US and in Europe, there are few, very few laboratories that have experience in doing loss of diagnostics. Uh, in West Africa, uh, a number of hospitals have um, good loss of diagnostics available. Generally, this is serology, so often looking for antibodies, but there are antigen tests as well that are commonly used, especially in these very hyperendemic areas. There have been rapid uh, diagnostic tests or lateral flow assays developed uh, to detect antigens. Their performance is relatively good, but that tends to be very regionally specific. And you can see um, uh, noted here that the genetic diversity of LASA means that uh, PCR testing and antigen testing and serology testing uh, often is best when your the test developed uh, is and, and when the test is developed and used in the same area, right? So tests developed from LASA infections in central Nigeria tend to work best in central Nigeria. Uh, tests developed for loss infections in eastern Sierra Leone tend to work best in eastern Sierra Leone. And so it becomes very difficult to have universal loss of tests that are uh, easy to develop and administer. In the U.S., 
uh, Lhasa specimens uh, or potential Lhasa specimens would generally be sent to the CDC uh, for testing. Treatment of Lhasa is also difficult to obtain in the US. Uh, the standard of care is now intravenous ribavirin, which is available in a number of uh, Lhasa referral hospitals in West Africa, <clears throat> but it is uh, difficult to obtain uh, on the international market. There aren't very many places that make intravenous ribavirin. It's also very expensive. Uh, and so over 5,000 euros per course, or uh, it's about $6,500, depending on the exchange rate. Uh, <clears throat> that means it's not necessarily easily accessible for uh, patients in West Africa. Uh, oral ribavirin has been used as a substitute if intravenous is not available. Oral ribavirin is a drug that we use um, uh, not terribly frequently in the U.S., but, but on occasion. Um, it's unclear whether oral ribavirin uh, has uh, good the And to be even intravenous, there's debate and controversy about how effective that drug is. For post-exposure prophylaxis, people have used oral ribavirin for very high-risk contacts, but it's important to recognize that oral ribavirin is not a benign drug. We, we encounter many side effects, some of them severe in patients taking oral ribavirin, and so that it really needs to be an individualized decision about whether that's an appropriate thing to do for post-exposure prophylaxis. And I'll turn it back over to Kate to talk more about Identify, Isolate, and Inform, and then it'll come back to me a little later for... Uh, Unfortunately, you have to endure me again for a few more minutes. <laughs> All right, Kate. Okay. Now, I really enjoy listening to you, James. Um, well, thanks, James, uh, for that. And I think um, that that really shows us that we really do need to be on our game and be ready to identify anything at any time. But when you think about it, when is it too early enough to to start um, identifying someone? Do you really have to wait until they approach your desk? Um, and I want to point you to a study um, that was done in the UK a few years ago. Um, and that really showed that, you know, we humans, we've got an innate ability to recognize when people are sick. You know, there, there's a facial clues, their, their body language, you know, the color of their skin or, you know, just, you know, are they sweaty and things like that. And, and it's kind of a defense mechanism for us to be able to back away from them and, and not get infected. Um, we don't always do very well at it, but um, we do have that ability. And so, you know, I, I would encourage you to read this study and, um, you know, learn from it and, you know, and teach your folks who are at the desk, if someone's approaching you and they've got these signs and symptoms of being sick, um, do something now, you know, put a mask on right away um, and help protect yourself. Now, of course, right now, because of COVID, you know, we are in clinical areas all wearing masks and uh, we're asking our patients to have, you know, a mask on as they come into the hospital. So that's really good. So we've already got that in place. Um, if, if that patient looks sick, um, the steps that you need to do to protect yourself and others, and by others, that's your, your other colleagues, um, other patients who might be in the waiting area or family members who are coming in or other people in that line, um, give, give them PPE. You, you've already got your PPE on um, and you need to prepare or start thinking about what you're going to do next if this does in fact turn out to look like a patient who's got some infectious disease. So this slide here, um, it's, you know, it's not April Fool's Day or anything like that. That This is put out, it's, it's a great way to illustrate that someone might look sick, but they might not be sick. You know, we've got this person on the left. He, he definitely looks to me like he's got signs of um, sickness going on. He, he looks tired. He looks like he's got some malaise going on. He's definitely sweaty. And uh, and I'm going to back away from him and I'm going to put a mask on. Um, and I don't really want him to come in too close to me at all. But what really happened to him is he just ran five miles. You know, he was out and ran and found out his wife was uh, in labor and he's run to get there. So, so there's a reason why he looks that way. Um, and, you know, you could back down a little bit until you've asked him the questions, of course. But um, the guy on the right, you know, exact same symptoms. Um, he just returned from Nigeria last week where he came in contact with rodents. Definitely um, the, the hairs on your back should be standing up and, you know, getting things in place right away. The thing that's going to help us know which one of those has, you know, the disease is the fact that, you know, every disease has got its own case definition. And um, the CDC has got that on their website. 
Um, and James just went through some of the signs and symptoms of lesser fever for you as well. But, you know, it's the clinical criteria. And those are the signs and symptoms. And because those can be nonspecific, we need to couple that with the epidemiological risk factors. Have you traveled? Have you had any exposure um, to anybody else that may have had this disease? And um, those are the things that you really need to um, ingrain in your staff to make sure that they're aware of all of this. The other part of that is, you know, you don't always know where that patient's going to come in. Um, you, all, all our hospitals, we've got multiple points of entry. Another thing that, you know, COVID has done for us is, is it has reduced the way that, you know, patients are coming in, but that's not going to last forever. But, um, you know, I always feel like, you know, patients or especially patients that might have be here from another country, they get sick, they're going to seek care and they're going to seek care anywhere that they think there's a doctor or a nurse there to help them. So that could be a clinic that could, um, it might even be like, um, you know, a uh, it could be your emergency department, but it might be your, your front desk where visitors are coming into your, your hospital. So you want to make sure that, you know, you're doing these screening and, and you've got people looking out for folks coming in with infectious diseases um, everywhere. The other thing is that these these patients, they may walk in, they might walk in by themselves, or they might come in with other people. So if they walk in by themselves, you know now, you know, what you're going to do with them. But you also need to have a plan on what you're going to do with those other folks that might be helping them to, to come in. They could also come in by ambulance. Um, and coming in by ambulance, they may already be pre identified as a PUI, uh, or a PUI is, you know, someone that we're going to um, investigate, a person under investigation uh, for a disease of interest. They might get identified on route as a, a, a this person that might be. Um, may have this, you know, highly infectious disease. Um, and if that's the case where they didn't get identified until they're already on route, you might need to think about what are you going to do with the EMS folks that are in the back of the ambulance with them. And of course, you may not identify them until they actually arrive at your hospital. And uh, there's lots and lots of ways that that patient come in. Another way that they can come in is through a direct admit. So making sure that, you know, as you get a report from maybe another facility where that patient's coming in from, or it may be from a doctor's clinic who's having that patient, you know, come in on their own, make sure that, you know, you're asking those questions. Um, get it during the report, you know, have, have they been screened? Um, what signs and symptoms do they have? And, you know, what are their... Um, risk factors for, you know, having a highly infectious disease. And then lastly there, you can see patient condition. You know, we might see patients come in um, in all, all conditions. We already do in our emergency departments. Um, they might be non-emergent. Uh, they might be emergent or they, they could be critical or, or, you know, even worse, they may ex expire on the way to the hospital. So really important that um, we're prepared at all the points of entry um, in our facilities. One of the ways that we suggest that you help to identify um, is to have the patients identify it themselves. So having signage available, but that signage can't be just like a little poster on, on a window somewhere or on a wall. It needs to be in your face and easily to, to um, you, you can't not spot it on your way in. Um, I don't know about you, but, you know, I've gone into places and there's been signage on doors that I, I've just completely ignored because I'm, one, I'm, I'm so used to it, but it, it just doesn't stand out. So make sure that these signs stand out and are so easily seen. They also need to be easily understood. And then, of course, you can go to pictograms. Pictograms are a great way, is, you know, universal language for everybody. Um, you know, down there on the bottom right is one of the um, pictograms that were used during Ebola. And you can see on the top, you know, it had a person with a, a thermometer in their mouth. And that was to say, if you've got a fever, put on a mask. And then, you know, at the bottom, it was a, a picture of a globe and then someone at a desk. And that's saying, if you've traveled overseas, please tell the receptionist. And so, you know, that way, you know, if someone can't read the language that's on the sign, they can follow that pictogram and they would um, know exactly what to do. So once you've um, identified that you've got a person um, that may have those signs and symptoms, they look like they're infectious, we're going to isolate them next. 
And to be able to isolate someone, you need to have a plan. You need to know where you're going to isolate them. Um, you need to know if that isolation room can be made ready very, very quickly. If it can't be made ready, it's you know, quick enough for you to be able to take that patient from the, the front desk or wherever they are to that room, then you need to have somewhere um, as a standby. It could be um, a triage room or, or just somewhere where you're going to isolate that patient so that they're not going to be able to infect other people. Um, but you need to know also how you're going to get that patient to that room. Are you going to um, walk them? Are you going to um, maybe put them in a wheelchair and move them through? Are you going to clear the area? You're going to make sure doors are closed. You know all, all those things um, just to um, just to know that when that person is identified, it's a smooth process moving them from that point of entry to the place where you're going to isolate them. It's also a good idea for you to have a car or a box or um, just, just something that has everything in it that you're going to need. And one of those things that you're going to need is a resource binder. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next slide. You also need to know, what do you need in the room? You know, what exactly do you need to take care of a patient so that you don't have any extra stuff in there that um, you don't need that might get contaminated? Um, but at the same time, if you take it out of the room and then you find out that you need it, you need to know how you're going to get it back in. Um, what would be the process for that? Um, managing work is something that you do need to know as well. Um, and it's not so much part of um, the isolation process itself. But if you're isolating someone, you've got PPE on, you're going to be taking that PPE off as you leave the room. Um, and, and there's all other kinds of waste that you're going to generate. So know how you're going to do that. Because that waste, you know, if that person does end up being positive for the disease of interest, you know, th there's going to be specific ways that that waste needs to be managed. The other really important thing is keeping a record of staff who enter the room. You're going to want to know that. You're going to need to know that because if the patient does have the disease, you're going to have to do some um, monitoring of that staff just to make sure that, you know, they didn't contract it. So this having a resource binder um, is great. Um, everything could be in one place. Um, just make sure that as you update policies and procedures um, or any SOPs, that you update them in your resource binder as well. Um, so that you've got your, your current SOPs, you've got checklists. And those checklists could be things like, you know, what it is that you have to do to prepare that room? What's coming out of the room? What needs to go into the room? Um, what kind of PPE do you need? What, what needs to be um, outside the room um, as far as, you know, resources that you're going to need to go in. Um, you'll need to know your supply lists. And, and even more importantly, you need to know the location of that um, those supplies. So if you have this cart that has all the um, information and resources that you need, you need to know where to find that cart as well. And um, keep it, you know, or, or monitor it, you know, quite a bit to make sure that everything is up to date and present on that cart, uh, cart that you're going to need. Once you've got your patient in the room, you're going to need to know how you're going to communicate with them. You know, what, you know, we can't just put them in isolation and close the door and then, you know, wait until, you know, whenever you think that, you know, you're going to be able to find out if they've got the disease or not. We still have to take care of that, that patient and take care of the symptoms that, that they're showing. Um, the communication, you need to be able to provide um, ways for a provider to provider communication. Uh, you need to provider to the patient and you need to be able to maybe allow the patient to talk to their family as well. You know, their family is going to be quite terrified knowing that, you know, this patient may have this really highly infectious disease. They may also worry that they may have it as well. And so, you know, communication is one way to alleviate a lot of stress. Um, but it's also really important in how we're going to take care of that patient. Um, and you can see in that little um, picture in picture there, the little box, you can see a, a provider, you know, talking to the patient. And, and that's a great way to do it. You know, have the provider outside the room, outside of harm's way, talking to the patient and able to still get all the information that they need. Now is the time to think about what staff is going to be involved in the care of that patient. 
So we know already that when we're taking care of patients, we have um, lots and lots of staff. You know, there's a whole um, disciplines coming in and, and taking care of your patients. You know, that could be dietary, your, your administrators coming in to do um, admission paperwork and things like that. And so who do you really need to have involved? Well, you need to have your nurses involved. They're the ones that are going to get the patients settled. They're going to um, hook them up to the machines if needed. They're going to, you know, insert an IV, maybe, you know, give medications if needed, things like that. You also need the, the physician to be able to come in the room. Um, they need to come in and do their assessment. Um, but there's other times where, you know, the physician may stay out the room and just communicate in um, from outside. Um, you also might need respiratory therapists. So really think through who needs to be in, who doesn't need to be in, and, and, and always think that the least amount of people coming into the room, the better. Um, next, we have inform. One of the things that, you know, as I've just spoke about identify and isolate, and I want to inform now, and it makes it sound that they're all very separate entities. But in reality, all these things are happening simultaneously. You know, you could be the person at the desk, you've recognized that they've got signs and symptoms, and they've, had, they've got this travel uh, risk as well. So right away, you've got to inform your charge nurse, you've got to let people know that this person is here, so that other things can be put in place. And that charge nurse is then going to go ahead and get EVS involved to get, you know, that room cleaned where you're going to um, put, that, put that patient for isolation. But inform, that's a really important um, uh, part of the identify, isolate, inform, because this is also going to let you inform people who are going to release resources to help you with everything that, that you're doing. And that, and that could be internal folks, and it could also be external folks. So we suggest that you have two buckets um, of information. So you've got your internal uh, group and you've got your external group. So this is, you know, internal communication. Um, have, have a chart, ha have a chart like this, where um, you can see that you've got on the left, you've got the people that you, you want to um, speak to. Don't use names. Um, you know, people leave positions all the time or, you know, they move up the ladder um, and other people come in and take their, their role. So um, it makes it really difficult if you use actual names. It's better to use the position and have the phone numbers for that position. And then have a secondary number as well, just in case, and maybe even a tertiary number. But, you know, you're, you're going to want to make sure that you're able to contact all the people um, that you can see on the left-hand side, um, your charge nurse, um, your infectious disease folks, and your um, staffing people, because staffing is going to change now because, you know, the, the folks are, or your staff who are going to be taking care of the patients in the isolation room, you may not want them uh, coming out right away and taking care of patients elsewhere in your facility. Um, th there's a lot of folks um, that you're going to need to be able to know to communi uh, communicate with very quickly, and that's going to be different for every facility. External communication, who, do you, who are you going to call? You know, um, public health, um, your EMS folks, your, your specialty services that you don't have at your facility. You may have somebody coming in that's going to need a dialysis and you might need it very quickly. And you need to know who are you going to call and, and, and get them in. Um, and it's, it's going to be different for every facility as well. So there's not a definitive list that we can give you. Um, that, that's up to you to know who are you going to call. Um, definitely get to know what your CONOPS is. That's the, the, your state and your region concept of operations. Um, if there is a, a patient like this. And you also need to know who's going to make those phone calls. You know, it's not going to be the person at the desk that's going to call your public health department. And then you can see in the bottom there, details are important, be accurate and relay needed information. So when you call the public health department, don't just tell them that, you know, we've, we've got a person here who's got these signs and symptoms. They're going to want to know a lot more. They're going to want to know that that person's name, they're going to want to know who they've traveled with and, you know, everything that they, they, they're going to need to know to help you um, do your job. Um, having an algorithm is a great way to help your staff learn, you know, or know what it is that they need to do. And, and it can be delivered um, on paper, 
you know, you could be asking these questions uh, from reading a, a form, or you could be doing it through your uh, electronic health record. Um, the electronic health records are a great way because what they do then is they fire like next steps at you. So, you know, once you, you know, you put in your um, exposure and your symptom questions, you're, um, if, if it's positive, then you're going to get an alert that's going to tell you that, yeah, you need to get into PPE and, you know, these are the next steps that you need to be doing. So we do have this available if, if anybody needs um, a copy of this. Um, so when you think about identify, isolate, and form, and Shelley already mentioned it earlier, you know, mystery patient drills, we do have those on NETEC uh, if, if you want to use them. Um, having communication drills, one, you know, that, that whole process of inform, who are you going to call? When are you going to call? Making sure that those numbers are pertinent still, you know, they're still um, going to get you to the right people. Um, the mystery patient drills, that's when, you know, somebody comes up to your desk and um, they're not really sick, but they're going to pretend that they're sick. And you're going to see how long it takes for your, your staff to identify um, and, and go through the whole process, you know, go through the whole process of having them identify them, getting them into isolation and, get, and getting them set up. It's a really great way to, to see exactly where you're at in that process. Um, by setting up rooms. Um, it helps your staff as well to know this is what the room should look like. You know, you could have a checklist that says, take this out, put this in, um, but, but there's, it's not as great as actually setting up a room and saying, this is what we want that room to look like when we bring that patient in here. You know, um, let them get accustomed to what would be there to help them take care of the patient um, and uh, know how they're going to be communicating, you know, once they're inside that room. The other thing is, you know, practice your PPE donning and doffing. You know, you're going to want to make sure that your staff can put their PPE on in a manner that's going to protect them and then that they're going to be able to function in that PPE to still protect themselves and then get, that, get them out of that PPE so that they're not actually going to be contaminating themselves uh, during that process. It's really, really important. So I'm going to um, pass you back uh, to James, and um, he's going to talk about how important it is to maintain this, identify, isolate, and inform during pandemics. It's all yours. Thanks, Kate. And we'll hustle through so we can hopefully have a little bit of time for questions at the end. I, I think there's a few lessons uh, going back to the case we talked about uh, in, in, in the UK, uh, a few lessons to, to draw from uh, when you examine what happened there. So I think the first is to, to keep in mind that we, we often think of these exotic infections presenting only in urban hospitals and, and urban centers. So in the middle of London or in New York City or Los Angeles. But the reality is they can present anywhere because we have immigrant communities and communities with strong ties to countries in uh, at-risk endemic areas uh, that exist all over the U.S. and, and Europe. And so uh, this community where this patient presented, it is not uh, uh, an urban community. It's, it's on uh, the far outskirts of London and bedroom and, and relatively rural community. That's uh, not necessarily the first place you think of for an exotic infectious disease. The second is you really have to have a high index of suspicion. As was mentioned in the case we saw, the patient presented, the, the index patient presented to the hospital was treated and discharged without anybody thinking uh, enough about the risk of loss of fever to order a diagnostic test at that time. And unfortunately, that resulted in the infection of a, a family member uh, and uh, death of an, another family member. Um, and keep in mind that we know who the folks are for highest risk of these infections, which includes close contacts, but also healthcare workers and those who have contact with remains. So undertakers and, uh, and or people who engage in burial uh, ceremonies in, in endemic areas. And then obviously we, we think of Ebola often when we think of uh, hemorrhagic fevers. And so we think about people who may be coming from uh, an, an outbreak area, but but again, Ebola is not the only viral hemorrhagic fever or uh, high consequence infection that we need to worry about that's transmissible from person to person. So we need to keep an open mind. So uh, as far as loss of fever goes, that risk is uh, with us every year, as I mentioned, uh, and especially in the peak months of January through March. Uh, this is a recent map from the Nigerian Ministry of Health and uh, the WHO showing that there's still another large outbreak of 
uh, loss of fever in Nigeria this past uh, dry season, just ending now. And you can see distributed across a large area of the country. Those two provinces down at the uh, the states at the lower part there, Ando and Ido, are two of the highest, uh, highest prevalence states, but again, occurs all over Nigeria. Other examples of Lhasa importation uh, that I think are important to note, one on the left here where there was a, a Dutch doctor just a couple of years ago that contracted uh, Lhasa fever in Sierra Leone, remember that other high, uh, highly endemic area in West Africa, uh, was working in a medical facility there and brought it back in uh, to the, the Netherlands. And so um, it, it's not only natives or folks visiting family back there, but uh, um, folks who are going to do um, uh, medical missions or uh, other work may come in contact with or may be in a high risk situation. Uh, another example where there was an importation of loss of fever into Germany in 2016 highlights the fact that uh, the healthcare workers are, uh, again, at significant risk. You can see there was an index patient uh, who was brought into uh, Cologne. Uh, but also a healthcare worker who had taken care of that index patient uh, while in West Africa, in Benin, uh, who had become infected as well. And then uh, a, a mortuary worker who took care of the initial index patient in Germany who also became infected. So it kind of highlights all of those high-risk populations that we talked about and the fact that loss is a lot more common. Uh, and we probably have a lot more imported cases that come into the U.S. and Europe than we actually diagnose and recognize. So finally, important note again, that the Ebola and Lhasa are not the only hemorrhagic fevers that we need to worry about. There's many others, including uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, potentially of increasing importance now since uh, Crimea, uh, as many of you likely know, is a peninsula in uh, the southern part of Ukraine, now occupied by the Russians, uh, but it is uh, one of the namesakes of CCHF and, and that area of southern Ukraine is a highly endemic area for CCHF, which is a severe hemorrhagic fever that can tr be transmitted from person to person. This case that came into a hospital in the UK just recently, again, uh, within the last week, was uh, from Central Asia, not from uh, the, the Black Sea area. But, but all of that region around the Black Sea uh, is, is uh, highly endemic for CCHF. And so we need to think about these geographic risk areas when we see patients who present with um, consistent uh, clinical syndromes. And this is a map, I think, of, yes, all of the areas around the globe where there are endemic hemorrhagic fevers. And uh, you can see it's much of a, a good swath of mostly the, the uh, uh, areas of the world between the tropics, but also extending up above and below, as you can see, into Southern Africa and into Central Asia, <clears throat> many areas of the world where there are um, endemic uh, hemorrhagic fevers. And we need to think about those when we're seeing patients with a travel history. If you ever have a question, you have a patient with a potentially consistent clinical syndrome and they have a travel history, you can always reach out to your infectious disease colleagues uh, just to ask them, hey, are there any diseases here that I should be thinking about? So I think that's it for me and I will uh, turn it back to uh, <clears throat> Kate and Shelley. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lawler and Kate, for that uh, updated recent information, as well as just reminding us, right, of this, this strategy that needs to be in place in every uh, front door uh, in healthcare, uh, no matter what, because there are lots of travelers, lots of folks uh, that, that potentially could move things around. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead to a few key questions. We did get some in advance. So let me ask our um, speakers about a couple of these. So the first one is, at what point would you transfer a patient, whether suspected, you know, so let's just say they're suspected of having like monkeypox to a special pathogen treatment center? What would be our timing with that, would it be after we get labs confirmed? Would it be based on symptoms or other variables that we might think about? Kate, do you want to take that given kind of the, the tiered structure and the, the approach? Structure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I would say to you that, you know, that would be directed by your public health department. So your public health department is you're going to be informing them that you've got that patient. Um, treatment centers, you know, like your um, the respects, you know, we're not we're not going to admit that patient until we have confirmation of that disease. But again, I mean, it could be different, you know, it could 
depend on the um, the level of suspicion that they've got that this person really does have uh, that disease. So I would just say that you would need to be in communication with your public health department and they will guide you on that. I know that's not like the answer you wanted, but. Yeah, and that might be a really be different. good to, to do, right? For mm -hmm. anybody on this call who may not know what their structure looks like. So there are 10 regional treatment centers across the U.S. in each of the HHS regions. So they're your kind of go-to experts for special pathogens, but then there are also some existing state-based ones. And then, of course, in, in the previous structure after Ebola, we've got, you know, the assessment hospitals, and some of those continue to exist where they could maybe do some of the diagnostic testing, but the diagnostic testing could take a while, right? So yeah. you really do need to work with your public health, like Kate said, to, to kind of make those judgment decisions based upon risk factors and, and lots of different variables that may exist. So the second question is, in recognizing high consequence infectious disease risks in patients who may, like let's just say, for example, somebody comes in unconscious, or a trauma patient, um, those might be kind of difficult to figure out, right? Different to do the identify uh, piece of this. Any words of wisdom on that? Me again? Okay. Sure, whoever. Okay, yeah. So, so that's that's a really great question, you know, because you know, was it the disease that helped them to have that car accident that put them in this condition and brought them into the hospital? Um, so, so yeah, you just have to be really vigilant. You have to be able to use your assessment skills. Um, think of things like, um, you know, when you're, you're doing the labs, you know, do, do they meet the criteria that James already mentioned, you know, with, um, you know, the low platelets or, you know, the elevated liver enzymes? Um, do they have the signs and symptoms of, you know, a disease that's not consistent with having been in, you know, the car accident or whatever else it was that uh, brought them into the hospital, things like, you know, a rash or profuse diarrhea, things that, you know, you wouldn't normally associate that way. Um, you would also um, always remember, no matter what, what the case is, you know, you've got a patient coming in, it's in trauma, you're using your standard precautions, you know, so your, your bloodborne pathogen uh, barriers and things like that. So, yeah, I, you know, it's really, it's, probably worthy of, you know, further discussion, but it really comes down to your assessment skills and, and putting all the pieces together. And then hopefully maybe, you know, contacting their family, finding out have they traveled outside the country? Is there, you know, any other kind of risk factors that may be present for that patient? Great. Yeah, Kate, I would just put the additional plug in for that travel history. I, I think uh -huh. that's an important component for any history and physical for a patient being uh, evaluated in, in the hospital. Um, I know that uh, sometimes we're, we're the ones who, uh, infectious disease physicians are the ones who kind of delve deep into some of those things. Uh, and, um, you know, obviously the uh, the, yeah. the breed of, of, of dog and, and type of farm animal you've had contact with or questions that we get into, but everybody should ask a basic travel history. And if the patient's unable to answer, you should really try and find a family member who can give you uh, some information about whether that patient's traveled anywhere. Because even if it's not necessarily relevant for the prevent presenting syndrome, if somebody's just come back from West Africa, you want to know that they're going to be potentially at risk for developing malaria during their hospital okay. stay so that you can uh, understand how to recognize uh, concerning signs and symptoms. Yeah. And another thing too would be another clue is like if they're from somewhere like Nebraska, like we are coming out over winter and they've got a nice tan and tan lines <laughs> that that would say they've traveled somewhere. <laughs> That's a good one, Kate. <laughs> and then uh, thanks, Dr. Lawler, for answering uh, the question in the Q&A about, you know, where are good resources and good sites? So WHO, CDC, like for our travel screening, um, like literally you, you need to go to the CDC page on Ebola, you need to go to the CDC page on Lhasa, but then you can plug in your countries and your travel screening so that it can can launch. We're hoping someday, right, there'll be an automated uh, strategy to connect to our electronic health records that might make that easier. But just asking the question will get, get us a long ways and then you can always look it up. So I really want to thank everybody for attending today. We've got a few things just to remind you of here. Uh, one is that we're here to help.
Uh, NETEC can help you with uh, any sort of questions you might have that you need uh, guidance or direction on, help you find a form, help you find a resource document or an exercise that might fit your needs. Uh, please send any questions to us at info at NETEC.org and there's a place out there on the website just to click on that. And these are just all the different places we're on social media. So please join us so you can always get the latest information. Uh, we have some great podcasts and other things that we're doing currently. Well, thanks so much. And we hope that you all will just keep in mind uh, the importance of the muscle memory we've learned from doing uh, identify and isolate and inform from COVID. And hopefully even as things come and go with COVID, we can continue to use this really important practice. So thanks and have a great weekend.